Uh, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. I know we're still going to have people uh, joining, but uh, given that we only have uh, 30 minutes today, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Um, thank you for joining us. This is our second in Berkman Klein Center's series on accountable technical oversight of generative AI. I'm Sue Hendrickson. I'm the executive director at the Berkman Klein Center. Last week, we started this series with BKC Responsible AI Fellow, Dr. Ramon Chowdhury, and Reva Schwartz from NIST on the landscape of generative AI harms. And today we're gonna to focus on a new tension on balancing security and transparency in, a quest, in the quest for accountability and open research um, regarding generative AI. Legislative efforts such as the DSA are providing new regulatory routes for increased transparency and access, um, yet how best to accomplish that in the rapidly evolving landscape of generative AI is not yet resolved. Um, today we're looking to tease out uh, what constitutes meaningful transparency and wrestle uh, both with, with the security risks that may come from sharing training data or code and the societal and other risks that may come from not sharing. I have with me today um, for this discussion and fireside chat, I'm thrilled to have Bruce Schneier, uh, internationally renowned security technologist, also known as a security guru. Um, Bruce is also, uh, I'm pleased to say, a long-term affiliate and long-term fellow at the Berkman Klein Center, a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School, and a best-selling author of 14 books and literally hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. His influential newsletter, The Cryptogram and blog, uh, Schneier on Security, are read by over 250,000 people. He's a thought leader that I and many others consult with to understand the nuances and challenges of the digital security landscape. Welcome, Bruce. Um, thanks for joining. Time is short, uh, so we're going to dive right into questions on this. Also, for our virtual audience, um, please add your questions into the chat box. We're hoping to make this an iterative discussion, and we'll try uh, to read in your questions uh, into the discussion as we're going through. Um, Okay, Bruce, uh, starting us off here, um, uh, I'm looking forward to thinking about the lessons that we can learn from the security landscape as we uh, tackle generative AI. Um, how should we consider uh, the trade-offs, and even if there are trade-offs between transparency and security in releasing, how should companies think about this in releasing their models and under underlying training information? So it's interesting. I, I, I tend not to like the trade-off metaphor. I mean, transparency is something you trade off with security. Transparency is one of the ways to uh, get security. So it, these are all gonna be security versus security discussions. So one type of security versus another type of security. In the, uh, in the software space, we have been dealing with transparency issues really since the beginning. Transparency isn't a goal, it is a method of achieving a goal. You might wanna know that an algorithm is fair. You might wanna know that software is secure. And, you might want to know something about the systems you're using. And one of the ways to get that is, is via transparency. It's the open source movement was built on this notion that if the software is public, many eyes can look at it and uh, vulnerabilities, bugs are found and your software is more reliable, more secure. And we can argue whether that's true or not, but that is the, uh, the, the conceit. Yeah. There are other times when transparency might be a competitive problem, right? Google is going to say, you know, we don't want to release how our search algorithms work. Even though that is transparency, then people will be able to game them. And if you know how it works, you'll be able to optimize your page to rise in the rankings. And that would be an insecurity. And so there, there are ways that transparency affects security, both good and bad. And the question is always, what are we trying to optimize for? Whose interests are we serving? And what are the ways ways to get that? Uh, think about, again, open source. Transparency doesn't give you security. I mean, you know, Linux is more secure because it's transparent. Doesn't make sense. Linux is secure because people are looking at it. And so there's a lot of open source software that is public, but it's obscure and no one looks at it. So you don't get the benefit of the analysis. So the, yeah. the value is analysis, then how do you get it? Right. So, I mean, that's actually a great topic because, you know, many of us saw the leaked memo by senior engineer at Google around no moat and this trend we're seeing right now in generative AI towards these smaller, cheaper versions of kind of best in class AI models is, you know, clear with the proliferation of these open source ones from Hugging Faces Alternative to ChatGPT to Alpaca, 
from Sanford, Dolly, Stable, uh, Stable, Vicuna, and others. Um, how you know? I, I like the way you frame that, and you know, I agree with you on that. That transparency isn't the goal; it's a method of it. How do we think about it in the context of these open source models that are being released and widely tested? Are they posing security risks? Are there things? How how should we tackle those differently um, as we look at these proliferation of open source models? There are security risks of giving everyone that powerful technology. I mean, we, you, you think about what's happening with ChatGPT, and there'll be ways people use prompt injection to get it to do things that the company didn't want, and they put in controls so it couldn't. As you get these models in the hands of everybody, a very international uh, hobbyist community, you're not going to be able to put in those controls. You know, if you have a, an art model, you can tell it, like, do not create fake IDs. And as long as the big company's running it, you'll be able to do that. Once that guard starts being diffused, you lose the ability to do that. So we're going to have models that will be racist and hateful just because those controls won't be there. This isn't uh, about transparency. This is really about how the technology diffuses. I think there's you know, a kind of enormous value in, in having this democratization. I think we're seeing going to see a lot more innovation, a lot more uh, a lot more new ideas, a lot more ways these things will work, and, and they're not going to be under control of these massive for-profit monopolies, which is a good thing, but it also has, has issues. This isn't a transparency problem. Now, transparency, if you think about what we might want, an AI is doing a thing, it is making a decision, and we want to know why. When I say I, I want this model to be transparent, it's kind of I want to know why it makes the decisions it makes. And there's a bunch of ways I, I can learn that. Maybe I can learn that by seeing the insides, but maybe I can't. Maybe that's not going to tell me anything. Maybe I can learn it by being able to audit the model. But right? am I allowed to query the model a million times and learn what its contours are? Right? It's making going to make this up hiring decisions. I want to I want to query it with counterfactuals. Right? We submit the same resume with different parameters uh, tweaked, maybe racial, ethnic, you know, the kind of things we might be concerned about, and see what the difference is. And these are forms of transparency that aren't releasing the the details of the thing, but might give us the information we want. So again, is you know what is our goal? releasing the full details of the AI model might be beneficial and might not. A lot of these things are non-reductionable in their complexity so that seeing all the parameters doesn't tell us anything. The ability to, to actually interact with it does. Right. I mean, that seems to be one of the real challenges here is figuring out kind of what actually would provide that kind of meaningful transparency that people are looking for in this context um, as to whether, you know, as you said, kind of will releasing it actually accomplish what uh, the goals are of kind of providing transparency? And are there ways to uh, to achieve those goals through that release? Like what what techniques would actually let you do that from these models? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I people like Kathy O'Neill have talked a lot about the ability to do algorithm audits, mm -hmm. and and I think there that's real important. Uh, Susan Benish talks about the same thing. You know, these these systems, whether they're you know AI or not, are making these enormously important decisions, and we have no ability to to audit them to to understand what they're doing. In a sense, I don't care why. If an algorithm is racist, I don't care why. I just want it not to be racist. So then I'll think about human systems. If a human system of humans is racist, in a sense, I don't know care why. I can't open the people's brains and look at the parameters and understand how they made their decisions. But you know, we as society want them to make more fair decisions by whatever that means. Uh, I'm... You know, I, I worry a lot that transparency is is not going to give us what we want. It's sort of chasing the wrong tactic for the goal. Now, I do like open source. I do like, I'm glad they're open source models. But I don't think we're going to get what we want by forcing you know, companies like Google or OpenAI to open up their models so we can evaluate them. Because that's not how we're going to evaluate them. We're going to need access to them. We need to understand 
then maybe we're going to need some access to their training data. But we might need that for a lot of other reasons besides security. I mean, you need to know if they're violating copyright or anybody else's rights right. or like, like, you know, or, or unduly taking the labor of, of millions of people and not compensating it. So we have a lot going on here. Right. I mean, do you see any of those as particularly um, security related risks or is it the broader collection of risks that we worry about when we're kind of seeking um, seeking this? And you you teed up perfectly our next uh, our next session on this, which will be related to audits and accountability mechanisms in this context. Because I agree with you fully that that is uh, one of the things that we need to figure out. You know how we're how we're managing here with respect to it. I mean, I, I mean the security risks kind of look like this, and this is, this will be the anti open source argument. Mm -hmm. If we give people the source code, the bad guys will be able to comb through it and find vulnerabilities and exploit them. Yeah. Right? That is what Microsoft will say. We will, we're not going to release our source card. Are you crazy? And all the bad guys will, will figure out exploits. Now, that that is a thing. We know from uh, decades of security that that isn't a real worry. That in fact, there are more good guys than bad guys and the good guys find things and we fix them. So it generally is a good thing to make your code public in, in for security, not a bad thing. But there are these instances, like Google's, like Google's search algorithm, where you don't want people gaming it. Where right. if you have an algorithm, I'm going to make this up for admission into college, and we make it public, now every high schooler knows like the exact GPA and the exact type of extra activities, kind of making this up. I mean, the exact right. yeah. ways to game the algorithm. And, and we don't want that. Right. And we've heard increased calls from kind of some of the large language model providers, too, to pull back from the kind of openness that's been provided on these security grounds, which is one of the reasons that we kind of wanted to tease this out some and think about whether that's whether that's real in attention with the open source community or whether that's. I mean, that's always been attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that's Microsoft versus Linux. That, mm -hmm. that I mean, that's the exact tension. We, we can do both things. We don't have to choose one or the other. We can do both. Different companies will make different decisions. And I think that's okay. I mean, the one isn't necessarily more secure than the other. The risks for one aren't necessarily the risks for the other. I mean, Microsoft keeps their source code proprietary, but we, we know pretty well that countries like China have gone in and stolen pieces of it. So, right, are, are we getting the value? <laughs> right, are we getting the value of that closed down, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and the benefit of open source is that we in the community get, get to look at it and play with it. Now, you, what you said earlier, there are open source models out there and, and there are several and the innovation has been phenomenal. Yeah. And, and we're learning a lot that you don't need months of computation, that these smaller nimbler, we're going to update them every day. They run on a high end laptop. I think that's going to be the future. And, and it sounds pretty good. But yes, I mean, there are security worries. There are security worries in, you know, the, the authentication, the voice authentication now no longer works. Video authentication now no longer works. Right. The authentication. Uh, yeah, the, really you have to me. send <laughs> Facebook a, a scan of your driver's license. Who thought that was a good idea? Well, now it's going to be a terrible idea. Yeah. I mean, all of these sort of security measures that kind of just barely worked now won't. I'm sure right. Jap ChatGPT can guess the answer to your secret questions. Yeah. Right. So, but, but these have always been like. So my secret questions, measure. my identity, the authentication—it's all out there now. What do we do? Is there a is there a solution to pull back any of this kind of you know security in a world where we're not going to be able to have this kind of authentication it, anymore? We're going to have to rely on other things. Right? So you know, if you think about your phone, right? When when you call me, I recognize you because of your voice. Mm -hmm. Voice and, and and shared history that you know we're going to talk yep. about things that that you know we know that we know each other. Uh, caller ID also exists, but it's kind of it, it's it's not secure. It doesn't work very well. But if I can't trust your voice, maybe I have to rely more on caller ID, which means maybe caller ID needs to be more robust. Maybe things like the phone company needs to do more to prevent SIM swapping, because now the other mechanisms are are failing. So I think there's going to be a rejiggering of security. I'm just trying to think about this. Yeah, and we've we've been using these informal methods, and because they worked most of the time, and they worked pretty well, and, and we might have to make some different decisions, given the ease of which you can fake 
data at a distance. So voice or video or photographs of documents, sort of all of those things no longer work. They kind of never worked, but they worked, they worked okay. Right. And now they're really not going to work. Exactly. So I think there are going to be some, some, uh, some bumps. And I think SIM swapping is a good example of this. So this is a, this is a, a problem where you would, when you when a hacker calls your phone company and convinces them to switch your phone number onto their phone. And it's actually surprisingly yeah. easy to do. And the reason it's easy is because the phone companies are not optimizing for security. They're optimizing for, I lost my phone and I bought a new one and I need to move my account, right? They're optimizing for ease of use and customer service. Yeah. And that that makes the attack possible. Right. You're making me realize that we're going to need quite a bit of security innovation around these um, around these issues in order to kind of tackle uh, some of the authentication yeah, challenges. And, stuff. and even worse, business innovation, which is even right. harder. I mean, businesses like to be easy. They don't like security. I don't think this is we need new tech. We're going to need phone companies to say, hey, you know, we need to make caller ID actually good and not accept crappy caller ID. We might have to do authentication from the phone to the tower, which we never did because we never wanted to and didn't have to. Right. So it, it, it's going to be the processes. You know, I, I mean, I, I, in this space, I'm a big fan of regulation. I think the market actually won't solve this very well. But it, you know, a, a lot of our assumptions are changing, and that's what's going on. And right. then what do we do to get that? I think transparency is going to be part of that. There will be a lot of other parts of making security work in this new era when things that we thought were hard turn out to be easier. Yep. Well, it's interesting when you say kind of a fan of regulation, I want to turn to one of the questions um, that we received because it's a good link to it. Um, so question from Adam Holland, if we imagine some sort of mandatory transparency in the mode of the DSA's soon to come database, it's not clear what that would actually look like practically. One difference seems to be that in the case of the DSA, we have sapient parties making requests regarding content. In the case of generative AI, we have what? There's a huge difference between looking under the hood and seeing what material is or is not in a library's collection, so to speak. How do we how do we think about this? How do we um, how do we think about whether that kind of mandatory transparency is going to be able to accomplish the goals that we're looking for and in the generative AI context? I mean, I think that's a really good way of framing it. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't. So I'm going to, do I mean, transparency? Do I want to see the model? Do I want to see the training set, like the data that goes into it? Do I, if it iterates, do I have to see each version? And I don't know. I mean, I don't think it gets us what we want. Which again, I think what, what I want is I want to know why the model did the thing it did and really, how can I stop from doing the, that thing next time? Whether it's making a mistake or acting in 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 some biased manner that 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 either either illegal or or, or unethical that we just don't want, yeah. Or it makes a decision that affects me that's important, and I want to know why. Like, you right. know, why did it deny me this benefit, this loan? Why did why did it dis make this discrimination? You know, put me in one pile versus another. Right, so and a kind of knowledge and explain a question. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want I, the transparency. I want is you know submit my my stuff ten times with ten different parameters changed and tell me when I get different results. Yeah, right? and that then that's what I kind of mean by an explanation there of, of right. why it did the thing. Exactly why the decisions and stuff are being made. Um, one one thing that's been kind of you know teed up is the idea of you know benchmarks for acceptable levels of security risks and what that you know might look like in this space. Um, can you just speak to that for a bit as to whether there's actually a kind of benchmarking process that could go on here with respect to that? And then I mean I guess we get to the question of kind of you know how would we think about what was an acceptable security risk and who would decide that? Yeah, that's really hard to do without knowing how it's going to be used. I mean, the, the, the AI doesn't exist in, in a vacuum. It's doing a thing. And, you know, in a chatbot, it's engaging in, it's generating human text. Uh, in some decision-making systems, making a decision. Or it's, act, or it's affecting the world in a direct physical manner. I don't think you can have security benchmarks without knowing 
what it's doing. I mean, what would it look like if you give it an AI system that that does that is there without without knowing what it I, I, when I think it does, I don't I don't see it. I don't see even how to begin to have a security benchmark. Because there's gonna be some level of risk. What's 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 the risk that this will make a bad decision? I mean, let's take a driverless car. Right. Like what's the risk it will accelerate instead of brake? That yeah. is a pretty reasonable question to ask. And so that we can talk about. And we can as soon as we instantiate it in that type of decision, we can develop uh, security benchmarks for what that means, which now now is really safety. So yeah, we, exactly. It's right? going to safety. Yeah. But but you know, safety to me, my difference is that safety is against the environment. So safety is road conditions and uh, day versus night and traffic and you know people walking around. Security is an adversarial environment. Security is the stickers you put on stop signs to make the uh, AI think it says 55 miles an hour speed limit. Right? It's a very different way of, of, of looking at the AI, an adversarial way. Does it survive a malicious, mm -hmm. intelligent, adaptive adversary versus does it survive all sorts of random weather conditions? They're right. Very no, it's an important, questions. it's a really, really important distinction and stuff. Um, I, I want to uh, add in, we got an interesting question from uh, Jonathan Horitz for you that I'd like to tee up, which is, is there anything qualitatively different for LLMs and previous statistical models in that we had a good, well understood, at least by people with enough of a mathematical background, theory that explained what the old models did and why, whereas LLMs, we don't have such a theory. No human really understands why they work as well as they do. Is this maybe why you talk more about getting Oracle access to a model than just seeing the source code? I think that's part of it. I mean, and this is why they're, they're approaching humans, right? We, we have no yeah. way to understand why they do what they do. And, and we know this from psychology. Human explanations are basically justifications. They're not explanations. They are, they're generated after the fact, after yeah. people make a decision. So, right, so we're getting to these models that are, that are so opaque, they're irreproducible, that like see... Why did it make the decision? Here are the 2 billion parameters. That's why. That's not a useful answer. And explanations are very much a human shortcut. They, they, they really represent the way we humans make decisions, not how these LLMs make, make decisions. So I don't think we can, we can usefully you know, open up the insides and see what they've done, just like we can usually open up human brains. So now we are, stuck's the bad word, we have to use what we can what we can see. Like what is the output? You know, so we're looking at the uh, you know the 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 class, uh, the incoming class of a certain university, and we see uh, you know we see a racial bias. And we say, look, I don't care how that happened, you can't have that. Did you use people? Did you use an AI? Did you use a mix? We don't actually care. Right. And, and I think in that case, we we have the tools already. To, to go after that kind of bias, you know? Right. And there are places where that is already illegal and it probably should be more. Right, and we thanks to also Akarsha uh, Surendar for another question. Um, if not through mandatory transparency, which it sounds like we're moving away from, is the responsibility to reduce these risks then left to the developers of these models? And if so, what incentive to do so if it slows down improving the capabilities of these models? Well, this is where regulation yeah, we're back work, to regulation. Right? I mean, that's I where we are. Because you're right. The incentive of the companies is to make a lot of money, not to be fair, not to be just, not to be equitable, not to do any of those things. Right? If we expect, you know, whatever, you know, pajamas not to catch on fire, uh, chimney sweep companies not to hire five-year-olds to climb them, whatever, all of these things, we have to pass laws. So, yes, it's going to be incumbent on the companies to make sure these models are fair and it's come on government to force the companies to make sure these models are fair. Then it's coming on government to check, to make sure the companies have actually done what they said they do. I mean, we're not going to rely on the market for this because the market is not set up to do this. Right. We, this is, I mean, but I think this is larger than AI. I, mean, the, the, I, I always think of you know, yeah. the market as, as a game playing on a field that government defines like we define what is the viable playing field in which competition happens 
And we have lots of laws that talk about, and whether they are safety laws or child labor laws or fair practice laws or truth and advertising laws, all of these laws determine how companies can operate. And these have to be more of them. We have no other way of doing that. Although that's, you know, I think one of the challenges that we're wrestling with is to try to figure out, you know, both how we can do that on a global basis with respect to it. We're seeing a proliferation of regulation right now in, in different spaces, figuring out how to harmonize that and then how, how we can actually make that kind of regulation effective, given the kinds of challenges that uh, we were talking about uh, beforehand. Uh, so I think it's an interesting, interesting dynamic at play that... Uh, because of the way, so I mean, not an AI in computer security. Uh, California has an Internet of Things security law. It's not that great, but one of the things it, it mandates is no default passwords. So if you sell an IoT anything in California right now, you can't have a default password. I guarantee you that no company has two thermostats, one for California, one for the rest of the country, right? They yeah. fix a default password and sell it everywhere. A good regulation in a big enough jurisdiction moves the planet. So you look at Europe, you look at their new AI law. Right, they're driving a lot of change. Right? The, the stuff they're going to require is going to benefit the whole world. So even though the United States is really dysfunctional, it's not going to pass anything here. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, right. The yeah. EU, who I think of as the regulatory superpower on the planet, will do things that benefit us. So I'm yeah. okay with the regulations not harmonized. Right? I'm okay with different regulations, different jurisdictions. Well, one, we're, 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 yeah, we're almost at time. So I just want to ask one uh, one uh, quick kind of question for you on, uh, thanks to David Harris. Uh, do you think it was responsible of Meta to release Llama to, re to researchers with such a seemingly low barrier to entry um, that it then leaked? Interesting question. I'm glad they did. And uh, I think the fact that it leaked, I mean, we've learned an enormous amount from, uh, basically the community. And these companies never understand open source. They're always blindsided by it. It's been true for decades. Uh, I think it's good. I think the democratization is really valuable. I think getting it in the hands of people who don't have a profit motive is phenomenal. I think We've these smaller, nimbler models are great. I think they're being, we're learning on a, on a lot that we would not have learned otherwise. You know, I, I never thought the responsible question. I don't think it's irresponsible that they they did it. So I guess I do think it's responsible. I'm glad they did. I think we yeah. in the world are, are benefiting enormously from it. And now it's done. I mean, it, it, you can't you can't put it back in the box. I mean, right. you, the innovation and, has been incredible. And, right. and, and, and other open source models are coming. So I guess even if even if they decided not to, it would just be a few months delay before some of these other ones are coming online. You you listed a, a few of them in the beginning. A yeah. lot of them are based on Llama, and some of them aren't. I guess all the ones that are other, was well, it Alpaca and Vicuña, yeah. and I guess Guanaco is the next one. Yeah. Uh, well, Bruce, thank you very much for uh, joining. We are at time, so I need to cut this off. I could continue to uh, talk about this with you for hours, and uh, you know, it goes back for me on this of trying to figure out how we deal with the, you know, some of these authentication and security challenges in this world now, where. Um, uh, it's going to be much more uh, where we can't put the genie back in the bottle. But um, but just uh, for everybody else who's listening, please join us next week for our third workshop on enabling, uh, Bruce teed it up a little bit on audits and others, but enabling meaningful technical oversight of generative AI. Uh, we'll have speaking Dr. Ramon Chowdhury, tech journalist Ju Julia Angwin, and CrowdTangle co-founder Brandon uh, Sol Silverman. So uh, That's a great lineup. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. And uh, thank you again for joining. And Bruce, thank you for uh, your words today. Thanks all.